This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 445, recorded on June 8th, twenty. 17. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Coming to you today from Kansas City, we're at the 14th International Nidovirus Symposium, NIDO 2017. It's really a NIDO meeting. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get three meals free with your first purchase with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twiv. So I have taken three participants in this meeting uh, for your listening pleasure at lunch. It was not easy to pick people because there's so many, over 200 people here. All of you could do a, a podcast. Um, but invite me back and we can do more in the future. So let me introduce my guests all the way on the left from Georgia State University, Margot Brinton. Welcome. Thank you. From the Spanish National Center for Biotechnology, Luis N. Juanes. Hi, well, thank you. Is that a good enough representation of your name? Yes, perfect. Thank you very because much. You are, yeah. And finally, from Ohio State University, Linda Safe. Thank you, Vince. Welcome to TWIV. Now, the weather here in Kansas City, it's sunny and 27 degrees Celsius, although we wouldn't know that in here because we're inside, I can barely see outside. Now you can see in the front of the table here, I have some TWIV t-shirts. In fact, I have six, six with me. I'm giving them all away. And I'm going to throw them out. Now, usually I throw them out into the audience. I don't want to throw them because I don't want to hit your food and get them dirty, right? <laughs> but I'm going to give three out right now. So if somebody wants to come, here you go, there's one, uh, two, mm, three, yeah, that's about the farthest my arm can go. I think I have to get one of those t-shirt guns for the future, yeah, to shoot them out. All right, so I thought we would chat with our guests about a little bit about their histories and what they do and what they plan to do. And uh, let's start all the way there with Margo. Where are you from originally, Margo? Where are you from? You mean where I grew up? Yeah. Oh, I grew up in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. um, near Gettysburg. Wow. And I uh, went to high school there as well? Yes. Where'd you go to college? Went to college at Duke. And were you a science major at Duke? I was a zoology major. That's pretty science, yeah. And then you decided to go to graduate school? Right. I went to University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. in and microbiology. PhD in microbiology. I know that department well. That was in um, Philadelphia, right? Right. Right. And then you did a postdoc where? Did a postdoc at University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. With whom? And then I worked for uh, three years at Riker Labs, which is a drug company ah. of 3M. And then I went back to Penn as a faculty member um, and then eventually moved to Georgia State. So how long were you, were you at Penn as a faculty member? Twelve years. Twelve years, okay. Now, where did the interest in science come from? You said you were a zoology major in college. What, where did that come from? I think I was always curious about things and I grew up on a farm and I always was interested in how things worked. Um, mm -hmm. And I had a very good science teacher in high school. My high school was not accredited because they didn't think it was just a country high school and they didn't see the need for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I um, had a very good science teacher and that's, I think, what got me interested in science originally. Science but, teachers, yeah, that's always it, isn't it? High school science teachers. So you said you grew up on a farm. Yes. What kind of farming was it? It was a fruit farm, mostly ah. apples. And did you, you, you help? Uh, 
Yes. In all the chores and so forth? We all worked yeah. <laughs> on the farm. Sure. And uh, so how long now have you been at Georgia State? How long? Um, oh, long I time. was there, um, well, I, I went there at the end of 89. End of the 80s, okay. Luis, where are you from? Spain. <laughs> you think that's all we all understand, right? <laughs> I am from the east of Spain, from Valencia. Okay. It's in the east coast. And I study chemistry. But I am an old guy by now. And at that time in my faculty were only basic science, mm -hmm. like mathematics, physics, chemistry, organic, inorganic chemistry. But no, let's say, biochemistry, for instance. Right. And I always wanted to work on biochemistry, right. life science. So as soon as I finished my chemistry studies, I, I got a sort of job in the medicine faculty. And I was working by myself. That was not a very good idea. Mm -hmm. So I decided to move to Madrid. And in Madrid, I started working with viruses. That was great. And I was lucky enough, I moved to a, a lab in Madrid on molecular biology of viruses. And since then, I, in Spain, virology was well developed because my bosses. But we had at that time very, liu, very little viral immunology. So when I got my PhD, my, my boss told me, what, what do you plan to do? And looking around in Spain, the only good companies were beer companies. So maybe I should go to a, a fa beer factory because I don't see other possibilities here. And he told me, well, if you go to the States and learn some viral immunology, I will do anything I can to make you inside the system. And I did it. I, w I came to NIH. NIH was a great place for me. I spent four years before in Bethesda and laid down at Frederick Cancer Research Center. And I can tell you that was so good for me that I went back and got a permanent position in the National Research Center. And so I, I am very thankful to NIH. I, NIH was a very good place because so many scientists running through NIH, so many good seminars there. Therefore, this is an experience I recommend to everyone. Sure. Linda, where are you from? So I'm from o Ohio. Um, I grew up outside of Columbus in the shadow of Ohio State University. I grew up on a small farm where we raised cats, dogs, horses, cows, Hmm. Um, cattle and chickens. So <clears throat> I went to a small rural high school like Margot mentioned. Um, and then for my undergraduate, I went to the College of Worcester, a small liberal arts college in uh, Worcester, Ohio. And what really got me excited about science, one of the requirements at the College of Worcester is independent study, hmm. uh, which is like a mini master's. Um, project. So I did my project in the veterinary virology lab at a branch of the Ohio State University on the Worcester and I really loved it and so I've really loved um, virology ever since but I actually started my PhD program at Case Western Reserve University in molecular biology and I started in basic immunology there so I kind of switched but I'm very happy for that because I've had a combined career in mucosal immunology and virology. And then um, I got married, so I had to transfer where my husband was, which was on the Worcester campus of Ohio State University at the ORDC. And I worked with a very famous veterinary virologist, Dr. Ed Bowl. On my project was on transmissible gastroenterovirus virus, the coronavirus of swine. And uh, it was at that time a devastating d disease, just like PD in swine uh, in 2014. 
So I've worked in coronavirus uh, research my whole career and um, met wonderful colleagues here at these NIDO meetings and early coronavirus meetings. So that's um, my major. So you've been at Ohio State pretty much all your yeah, career? Yeah, since uh, I've been on the faculty since 1979. And uh, so I guess, uh, 79, I <laughs> guess you've liked it, right? Well, in two career families, yeah. <clears throat> it becomes challenging to find dual positions that both of you love. And we were fortunate there to find that position, plus it has the animal resources that I really needed for my research, including germ-free animals. And it's one of the few facilities that has that. So that's kept my husband and me both there. And he was an expert in poultry disease. Yeah, I understand the two, the two career problem. But uh, nevertheless, you've thrived, so it wasn't such a bad decision. Thank you. No, thank you. So Margo, uh, let's talk a little bit about your science. Can you hear me well enough? Is, it, is this loud enough? I'm sorry? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I have to tell you that um, this 2002 paper that you published has been a, a staple in my virology course. It's called Positional Cloning of the Murine Flavivirus Resistance Gene, 2002. You remember that paper? Yes. <laughs> and I always cite it as one of the earliest papers showing you know, a, a host gene that's involved in controlling uh, virus susceptibility. Do you remember why you got involved in that? Well, I started that project as a graduate student. And um, in those initial days, all we could do was just characterize the phenotype. But it, it's an amazing phenotype because you can inject um, high levels of lethal um, encephalitis flaviviruses into the brain of the mice and they don't show any symptoms at all. Wow, right in the brain. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, it had been shown that the um, resistance gene for the flavivirus co-segregated with the gene for uh, rickettsia, mm -hmm. and they had mapped it to a chromosome. And then a, a lab in Australia um, had used recombination in mice to further map down on that chromosome. So they had a region with a microsatellite that seemed to be a reasonable length to do positional cloning. And, and I had never done positional cloning, but I thought that would be a way to really try to identify the gene. And this was all before the genome had been sequenced. So there weren't many yeah, genes yeah. in the gene bank. And we assumed that we would find about eight genes in the, the 240 um, kill, mega, uh, sorry, um, region that, that um, we thought that the, the gene would, would map to. But in truth, we found 20 genes there. So it was a much more dense gene region. And that was due to the fact that one of the genes, OAS1, had duplicated, so there were eight versions of that. And then we sequenced each of the genes we found in the resistant and susceptible um, strains to find out where there were mutations that could affect function. And we found then that one of those genes um, fit that description, and then we tested that in other strains and found that whenever there was a premature stop codon, you had susceptibility, and whenever you had the full-length protein, you had resistance. Neat. And we found a gene that normally acts in the 25A um, RNA cell pathway, but it does not have that activity. And so we're still trying to figure out exactly how it works. Uh, is there any evidence that these control human susceptibility to infections? No, the, there is no real um, homolog of this in humans. So in humans, the OAS1 protein, there's only one gene. It has splice variants, mm -hmm. but it, um, all of those are active yeah. um, synthetases. Now, so I, I teach a virology course, and I use that as an example of mapping host susceptibility because it's one of the earliest ones where you could actually identify the gene product. So I wanted to tell you that because maybe you hear your ears ringing when I'm talking about it. Um, 
I want to ask you about an interesting virus that maybe, well, maybe at this meeting many people have heard of, but we certainly have never mentioned on TWIV, so this will be the first time. Lactate dehydrogenase elevating virus. Yeah. Yes, that's one of the, um, that I worked with that as a postdoc, and it's a very interesting mouse virus. It causes persistent infections, mm -hmm. but the titers um, go to 10 to the 10 within um, one day, come back down to about 10 to the 7, um, and then stay at that level pretty much for the rest of the life of the animal. And in most strains of mice, there is no disease, um, but there are a few cases, um, C58 mice, for instance, where if there is immunosuppression and um, cells in the brainstem um, get infected, then the, the body still mounts an immune response to the infected cells and ends up causing um, encephalitis and demyelinating disease. So is it still called lactate dehydrogenase elevating virus? Yes, it is LDH3. still called. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and, and that's because there's no plaque assay. So the only way you can titer it is that you inject it into, <clears throat> into mice, excuse me, and then you measure the elevation of lactic dehydrogenase three days after the infection. I see. And, and the reason that it elevates that is because it grows in a subpopulation of macrophages that clear turnover enzymes. Mm -hmm. And so when they get infected the clear and die, then the clearance is right. not as efficient. Right. <clears throat> Does anybody work on this virus anymore, as, as far as you know? There um, is, was one man in Belgium mm -hmm. who kept working on it, and we're, we're actually thinking of working on it again. Yeah. Let's see if anybody in this room works on LDH3. No. Nobody. Okay. Another, another interest uh, of your lab uh, over the years has been proteins that interact with the ends of the viral RNA, right? How did you get interested in that? Sorry, in the what of so you were been you've been interested in proteins that interact with the ends of the oh, viral the RNA. three prime, five prime. How did you get interested in that? Well, we were not the ones who discovered that, but we were interested in the structures at the three prime and five prime end, and so then as one of our projects, we wanted to see just exactly what you needed to get the three prime and five prime end to interact. So we did a series of mutations down that whole region and found that um, areas beyond what had been defined as the initial cyclization sequence were also involved in that interaction. Right. But, but as part of that, I was more interested in the terminal stem loops and the cell proteins that they interact with and how those can act as transcription factors for the virus. And we're still pursuing some of those studies as well, now going to structural analysis. One of the more recent findings from your lab is that components of stress granules interact with the ends, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that? So the, the most recent paper um, was talking about the fact that an unusual finding was that um, Flavivirus infections could um, resist ar uh, stress by arsenite treatment, mm -hmm. but not by treatments that affect that activated the other kinases that phosphorylate EIF2 alpha, and that would suppress translation. And so we wondered why that was, why there was that specificity, and that led us to a whole study of looking at the ability of these viruses to activate um, the reactive oxygen species and, and induce oxidative stress, but then on the other side, a very strong antioxidant response that um, neutralized the oxidative response and also gave excess capacity so that when you treated with um, arsenate, it, there was no effect because the antioxidant pathway was um, able to control it. All right. Now, these stress granule components, 
Uh, do you think that their binding to the viral RNA is a, a means of antagonism, the formation, the formation of stress granules? We think that one of them is involved as a transcription factor for right. making Plustran, but we don't think that it's being sequestered. Okay. So we don't think that's the mechanism. I, initially, that appeared to be the case, but that does not seem okay. to be the mechanism. Yeah, I, I ask you because it's in our textbook that it's possibly a mechanism. <laughs> Sounds like we have to revise it. So, uh, Margot, if you could point to one experiment in your whole career that you thought was really cool, more than any others. Oh, that's hard. Um, I, I, I don't know, whatever I'm working on, I'm interested in, so I, I think um, I, I can't really answer okay. that. Okay. <laughs> I'll come back to you with another card question. Luis, um, you've worked on a wide range of things. What would you characterize your interest, if you could give it a general description of all the work you've done, what would you call it? Well, basically, particularly at the beginning, I was interested in viruses infecting macrophages. Uh -huh. Because cells from the immune system, I thought that would be relevant. And we have to go back to the old times, otherwise people will not understand this. We got in Spain, Africa, and swine fewer a virus. How we got this is because we were, we are near Portugal. Portugal, they have troops in Angola, in Africa. And the soldiers from Portugal, when they were coming back, they brought back food that was contaminated with African swine fever virus. That was a disaster for, for our country. You know, we produced this fantastic ham, jamón. Mm -hmm. Top quality, so having African swine fever virus will be a, a, an economical disaster for our country. So my mentor, Eladio Viñuela, that was trained in, in New York State University, he was just a molecular biologist, but he never in his life was working with mammalian viruses. And he was brave enough to start a new line of research on African swine fever virus, a double-stranded uh, DNA virus. The genome was very big, more than 100,000 nucleotides. So during my PhD thesis, I was characterizing the structure of the genome of this virus and the interaction with macrophages. And Young people cannot imagine the work we were doing at that time because I just want to tell you that a PhD thesis in the 60s was to purify ECO R1. So that was a, a whole PhD thesis. Very hard, you know, because when you try to purify to really homogeneous protein, you never succeeded because when you try to cut a reference DNA, it will be cut in many places. And we got the visit from an American friend, American scientist, expert on restriction and nucleases. He said, oh, come on, don't try to purify EQR1 to homogeneous state just with the stuff you already have, what you have to do is to look for the conditions under which salt conditions and pH conditions in which only your activity, the activity you are interested in, will be purified. So we were close to suicide, and then with this very simple advice from Bob Juan, in one week, we got the activity isolated, just not by getting a beta purification, but by looking for the pH and soil conditions that will give us only this activity. So that was really helpful. Sometimes you have to pay attention to visitors that know, know the things. So we clarified the structure of the DNA of this virus 
uh, huge virus, but things didn't work properly because we thought it was a double strand DNA virus, but there was some strange behavior. And when we denature this DNA virus, it turned out, turned out to be a single stranded DNA. So the double stranded DNA virus had links at both sides, and that became very interesting. Also, it became interesting that Many people was claiming that DNA viruses, they don't have too much genetic variability. Certainly that was not the case. They have many huge vari variability. They lose many genes and completely change the structure. And the other aspect, the, the interaction with macrophages was very interesting. And of course we were checking at that time whether this virus will infect human beings. Because, you know, pig production in Spain is, was very important and very, very large. And I remember collecting blood from many species, including human beings. And when I infected human macrophages, we realized that they got infected by this porcine virus. We became afraid, but soon later we realized that was a non-productive infection. But the main problem we had is, I am trying to look for fancy things at that time, there was a, an assistant professor, a lady at Harvard, and he associated African swine fever virus to AIDS. So she published an article saying that AIDS was caused by African swine fever virus. Tell you the explanation for that. She was an epidemiologist, and at that time in the States, the gays, when they got married for the Holy Moon, they went to Hawaii. And the theory how this virus, porcine virus, got into human beings. Because those people in Hawaii, they were eating hamburgers, and when they asked for raw meat, the virus was not, was not completely neutralized. And frequently, it's true that gays, they have a stomach ulcera, so the virus from the meat will go in and will cause AIDS. So you can imagine when she, a, a, a professor from Harvard published that, WHO in next day was calling to our lab and we were very afraid that, you know, I, I remember I had to purify large amounts of this virus and they asked whether we could check whether that was true, whether selected sera from, from people infected uh, with AIDS will react to our virus. We had no P3, P2, P anything. I mean, not to the stage, we, the standards we have today. And we, we could prove that there was no relationship between a huge DNA virus growing in the cytoplasm in the, of the cell with an RNA virus growing much smaller one, yeah. Growing, yeah. growing the nuclear. So I didn't realize that story. That's very interesting and uh, important to clarify these things, of course. When did you switch to uh, coronaviruses? Well, first, I, at that time, it was obligatory to, to get a position in Spain to come to the States. I went to NIH. There I was studying with the viral, viral immunology mechanism of Moloni leukemia virus. I was in a very good laboratory and was very excited. We proposed a mechanism for that. And then I, I came back to Spain. Even before coming, I was lucky enough to get a permanent position there in the government. And then I started my project on coronaviruses. Since I had experience with virus macrophage interaction, I had chosen at that time a coronavirus that it was reported to infect macrophages, although that was on the books. 
the virus I had chosen, only the the wild type virus, the virus straight from the field, they will infect macrophages. But since then, we I started I work with macrophages, many different aspects until today. At that time, we were nobody until SARS and MERS came in. <laughs> that changed the field completely. Coronavirologies became more important, as, yeah. as you can guess. Okay. I like to joke with Susan Baker that before SARS, the coronavirus field was a sleepy field. And then all of a sudden, it got lots of prominence. Now, I want to point out a paper that you published, which I noticed, being in a different family, uh, engineering the largest RNA virus genome as an infectious bacterial artificial chromosome. You remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> as you can guess, that was the case, yeah. Many laboratories all over the world were trying to, to get an infectious DNA clone from coronaviruses. But as all of you know, coronaviruses, they have the largest RNA genome for any known RNA virus, 30,000 nucleotides. And the difficulty of getting an infectious DNA clone is that any time you clone mammalian sequences from either mammalian cells or mammalian viruses in bacteria, they are toxic. So if you are doing, if your problem is getting the infectious DNA clone of uh, an RNA virus with 10,000 uh, nucleotides, that is relatively easy, but 30,000, that was too much. So very good groups in Germany and even in the States, they failed to do so. And always for us, so for Spanish students to be successful, they have to come to the States. And of course, they go back to Christmas time to visit the family. And one of my former PhD students was in in the West Coast, California. And, you know, when they came back, they visit us and we interviewed them and said, hey, Luis, you know, the human chromosome has been cloned and sequenced. And I said, I don't believe it. I, I imagine that 95% will be cloned and sequenced, but it's toxic when you work with those things in, in bacteria. They, I am sure they miss the clones with the toxic sequences. So I think they have 98 or so, but not the whole thing. So no, Luis, Luis. But you know, in California, they have a special system where they can a special bacteria and a special uh, plasmids, the bugs. The bugs, and they have the um, advantage that they grow in bacteria and they only make one, maximum two copies per cell. Therefore, even if the sequence they have cloned there is toxic, they don't die. So we say, oh, no, that's, and that's very, very interesting. That may help us, you know, because our virus is so large. And I thought that was the beginning of the success. This just conversation with my former PhD student and, and the advice they gave me. But when you do the cloning in bugs, don't look for nice, beautiful colonies only for the tiny ones, yep. because yep. they grow, but they right. have problems, so they don't grow too much. So, I mean, this advice was great. In addition, we use another strategy. We, we were working hard, and the strategy we followed to succeed was that we had very well-characterized DI genomes. So we had, not the whole, the full end genome, but small ones, very well sequenced and characterized, they had deletions, and we were filling in the deletions one by one, and we said, well, that's fantastic, you know, in two more months we will have the full-length infectious DNA clone. And we all were almost right until we reach one domain in which the PLP domain was highly, highly toxic. And But we, we, we look for our private strategy, and we were successful with the cloning. So successful that when they accepted the paper, PNAS, 
the commentary to the paper was longer than the paper itself. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that was very right. helpful because now we can engineer right. any coronavirus. So that you know. was the first example of being able to make an infectious DNA. Yeah, that was the first clone time. Clone copy. That, yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So do you have a, a particular experiment that you really liked throughout your whole career? Well, all I know is that lately with the virus host interaction, yeah. viruses, they need the cell to grow up. They do. But also to, to cause pathogenesis. Mm -hmm. So it is very important to do basic studies on virus host interaction and to identify two, identify two aspects. One, which cell genes the virus needs to grow up. Because if you identify them, you identify those signaling pathways in which those genes, they intervene, then you can isolate uh, drugs that will block the virus growth by blocking those signaling pathways. So we will have antivirals. And the other, the other aspect is that viruses, they, sometimes they cause pathogenic, pathogenesis not by themselves, but by the immune response they are inducing, and that need the stimulation of a specific signaling pathways. And again, again, by identifying those signaling pathways, then you can identify drugs, and more importantly, you can attenuate those viruses, because if you know the genes involved in this pathogenesis, and you delete those genes from the genome, then the virus becomes attenuated, and unattenuated viruses are, in principle, a vaccine candidate. Therefore, I think that we were very lucky when we identified, we were deleting genes one by one, and identifying those that were involved in virulence. Then we had a strategy to attenuate viruses and vaccine development. And also when we understood some mechanisms of why these viruses were virulent, how they cause pathogenesis, we had another pathway to identify drugs that will block those signaling pathways, and therefore we could identify antivirals. So I think basic research is very important and can lead lay down to uh, important applications like vaccine development and drug development. Linda. Oh, yes, I'm still here. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry there's sound problems, folks, but uh, as I said, you can always listen on Sunday. I know, it's the sound guys. Um, what, what would you characterize all of your work over the years over? I know you've been interested in diseases of Pigs and cows, would that be yes. mainly it? And animal models of animal human models. disease as well. So what, what viruses uh, have mainly interested you? So over the years, as I said, I started with coronavirus, and we've continued that work in swine and cattle because new coronavirus keep appearing or they have different tissue tropisms that develop. So I also work on Khaleesi viruses, uh, sample virus and norovirus. We set up a germ-free pig animal model for human norovirus, and that's been pretty productive. And also um, the other animal model we set up for human rotavirus. We collaborated with NIH when we established that model um, to look at the immune factors related to protection as well as uh, how to attenuate the virus which was the basis finally for human oral vaccines. And then also with uh, TG and, and our basic research on vaccines and gut memory connections. So those are the main virus, rotavirus, coronavirus, Khaleesi virus. So the, the, um, the noro and the rota are to understand human pathogens, right? Yes, although we've always more or less done parallel research right. because rota is also a disease problem in swine, especially just like human infants, ba uh, baby swine, nursing mm -hmm. piglets. And when I started working, there were no vaccines for that. Now there are some vaccines to induce maternal immunity, live attenuated oral vaccines. Um, norovirus, there are um, some norovirus in cattle that cause uh, severe diarrheal disease, like in humans, 
Um, there are some in pigs, but they tend to occur in older pigs with less pronounced disease. And then there are sample viruses that occur in swine that are very similar to the human sample virus. So swine and cattle have the counterparts of many of these human agents, so we can understand disease both in the host and how this can translate for the human host. You also mentioned TGEV. Tell us, right. tell us a little bit about that. So um, when I started working on transmissible gastroenteritis coronavirus in swine, we had this scenario in the U.S. and worldwide that was pretty much like what we're experiencing now with PDV. It came into a seronegative population of swine. There were tremendous deaths in neonatal pigs. It spread um, throughout the country. There were no vaccines, no antivirals when I started my research. Um, not that much was known about immune responses in swine. There were no reagents. I had to make all my own swine reagents to study immunology. So that took a lot of time during my master's PhD. But I think the major um, breakthrough there was to look at the types of immune responses in the swine that recovered from infection in their baby pigs, and then try to develop a way to mimic that type of infection and protection. And we found those were associated mainly with IgA antibodies in the colostrum milk when the pig recovered. If you gave an intramuscular vaccine, it was mainly IgG antibodies and non-protective. So that was the basis for live oral attenuated vaccines for use in cells to um, stimulate what we found was stimulation of the gut mammary uh, link immune system. So we were among the early people to describe the common mucosal immune system in this link between infection of the gut and protection uh, through the milk and colostrum through mucosal secretions. So is there now a TGEV vaccine? Yes, um, there are currently TG vaccines, but what happened was there became a naturally occurring mutant of TG, a respiratory strain that was naturally attenuated. It was more effective in transmission as a respiratory virus, so it spread worldwide and it's acted as a natural vaccine for TG. Oh. So you don't need to vaccinate anymore? Um, not so much. Some people do. Sometimes there are some outbreaks of virulent TG in Canada and the U.S., but not nearly as much as there used to be. Also, I think, in China. So the, the infection is uh, mild enough so that you can let it spread and not worry about pathogenesis. The PRCV? Yeah. Um, there was really no attempt to make a vaccine because people thought it was not commercially viable because there was not a disease associated with it. Now, you've um, used animal models a lot, obviously. So having a facility where you can do that is important, right? Yeah, it's essential. And that's why you've probably stayed at Ohio State. You couldn't do that in New York City. Mm, it clearly. would be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> well, it costs $5 a day per cage per mouse for mice. So I can't imagine what it would be for a pig or a cow. Now, you mentioned notobiotic animals. What's yeah. the significance of that? So the importance of the notobiotic animal is we didn't know to start with what agents was causing what disease. Mm -hmm. So that allowed us to infect animals that don't have a micro microbial background at all, no other uh, extraneous viruses. Um, they also, the piglet is such, it doesn't have maternal antibodies. They only acquire it um, a after birth mm -hmm. through the colostrum. So that gave us a naive animal and a highly susceptible animal and so we were able to use that animal to sort out the cause of these various enteric infections. The sapoviruses, the first isolation was in the germ-free pig, the rotavirus, the coronavirus. And what also, in terms of animal models, we were able to model this for human uh, rotavirus, but more importantly, no one could grow human rotavirus strains in cell culture. And of course, that was the basis for the future attenuated vaccines. So we collaborated with NIH. We got some infant stools. We put it into germ-free pigs. It was fully infectious for the germ-free pig. And there are a lot of similarities physiologically, anatomy between pigs and humans, though people don't like to admit it, but there are. <laughs> <laughs> so this allowed the virus to propagate to high titer. It got rid of interfering antibodies that were there probably in the original specimen. 
and then we sent it back to NIH and we also continued to work on it, that somehow allowed the virus to replicate then in cell culture with the addition of proteolytic enzymes that are present in the gut. The other, I'd say, interesting aspect is that we've continually looked for ways to diagnose these infections, but also replicate these viruses in cell culture. They're fastidious. It's not like MERS and SARS that was so lucky they grew for these respiratory viruses, but these are very fastidious, very hard to grow. So when we worked with sample virus, it would not grow in cell culture. So what we did, we took the intestinal contents from an uninfected notobiotic pig, we put them in the culture media without knowing what all was there to allow it to go, but assuming it might be something like proteolytic enzymes. And by doing that, we were able to adapt porcine sample virus to growth in cell culture. So things come around in science very frequently. Yeah. So what happened is now Dr. S's lab, who's using the human enteroids, was able to adapt some norovirus strains. We found the, the component in the intestinal contents that was effective was bile acids for the sample virus. That same component, bile acids, is effective to grow human norovirus right. now. Yeah. So it's a, you know, you, you never know when some of these serendipitous findings will be applied, you know, to other species, other viruses, and it's been very productive that way, I the think. The serendipity of science, <laughs> no doubt about it. Um, do any of these animal viruses pose threats to humans? Well, the, we're not sure if there might be some noroviruses that are transmissible to, to humans. There have been some spillover cases with some bovine mm -hmm. um, coronaviruses. Um, again, some of the sample viruses are fairly similar to humans. Yeah. The, the interesting component there for the norovirus and sample virus that are in cattle and swine is that we did an epidemiologic study. We found these animal norovirus, caliciviruses, are also present in shellfish. Mm -hmm. So for the people who eat raw shellfish, not only are they eating human norovirus that comes through sewage, but also the animal caliciviruses. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a caveat <laughs> if you like raw oysters. Yeah, I would stay away from, they're great, but cook them. What's that? Yeah, keep your immune system educated. That's right. A you did a, you have a few papers where you're looking at noroviruses and lettuce, binding <laughs> to lettuce, right? What is that about? So that's in collaboration. I've been lucky to have tremendous uh, postdocs, graduate students in my lab. So right now we're very fortunate that we were able to retain one of my very talented graduate students, Dr. Kihan Wong. And she's actually um, taken over some of that work, and she's actually written a USDA grant for that. So we know that, that noroviruses bind to histoblood group antigens, which is a unique feature of noroviruses, and that allows them a big repertoire in humans for different histoblood group antigen types. So every, every blood type, there's an analogous norovirus that can bind. So we thought, well, maybe there's something going on in these uncooked vegetables that actually allow the virus to bind so you can't wash it away. So there are some lectin-like binding particles that the norovirus binds to lettuce. Got it. So is there any one uh, experiment over the years from your lab that you particularly like? I know it's a loaded question because it means you're going to single out someone's work, but sometimes there's a one. Well, I, I would have to say probably one, two of them that had the major impact was the passage of the human norovirus in the notobike pig model and then being able to grow it. And that was a key for future research on that virus. Um, I think the other one was this gut memory connection, discovering that the cells that recover from the virus infection and the next litter, the litter can be protected, and that's due to this high level of Ig antibodies in the colostrum and milk. Okay. So let's go back to you, Margot. Now, I, I asked you before about one, one experiment, so let's, let's look at it differently. What do you think has been your biggest um, gift to science, let's say? Your, your most important 
contribution to science as a field? Probably cloning the OAS1 B gene. I, I think that was probably, um, but the thing is now that we know what the gene is, we still don't know how it provides this amazing resistance. Right. So, so now that has led to studies of partners and looking at whether that complex is in the region where the replication complexes mm -hmm. of the virus are located. Okay. So, Luis, what do you think is your important contribution to the field? Well, probably I will differentiate two things. To get the, a reverse genetic system for a coronavirus was... Can you... Mend the development... Poke the uh, mic. There you go. The... Probably one thing was the development of a reverse genetic reverse system genetics, okay. for coronavirus. This is a very important tool. Once you achieve this, you can modify the life of the virus and turn a pathogenic one in a non-pathogenic mm -hmm. one and analyze the relevance of the different genes. And certainly, uh, other people did it immediately. Ral Barik, uh, using a completely different strategy, he also succeeded. And lay down, deleting one by one different genes, we identify the small envelope mm -hmm. gene, mm -hmm. a small protein with many activities and many domains. Okay. Deleting each gene has been very important because this gene contains uh, a at least two domains involved in the virulence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Young students, they think that a virus may kill because it grows to high titers, but certainly this is not the case. There are many viruses that they are growing in our body and they cause very little pathogenicity. The pathogenic viruses are those that they carry virulence genes and by identifying those virulence motif, this is very important because you can change mm -hmm. the life of a virus. So working on these lines, we identify E protein as a protein containing virulence genes. And that has been being highly productive in our life. So I think that was very important. Uh, how about you, Linda? What, what's your contribution to science? Well, I mentioned a couple of our or what I thought were more breakthrough research, but I would have to say that I think for a professor, your most important contribution are the students and postdocs you train. And I think that's our legacy, <laughs> that they continue in the area and continue to develop the field and the knowledge. I, I always hope someone says that <laughs> when I ask people that. Uh, so, Margo, science is hard to do, it's hard to get jobs, it's hard to get funded. Do you have any advice, you've been in the field a long time, you've seen things change, do you have any advice for the young people out there who want to be in science? Well, I think a lot of luck is involved. Um, <clears throat> and when, it, for instance, in my career, I didn't get to choose where I landed. It was based on family issues. And then I had to make do with where I was. But um, I found good collaborators and I went where my experiments led me and was never afraid to learn new techniques or jump into a different area. Um, so I, I think that being able to really think broadly and um, and yet think about what's relevant to what you want to do and and how practical it is whether you can really assemble what you need as far as people and and um, techniques to to get the job done the, those are all very important um, issues in succeeding right. Luis, do you have any advice for young people? Well, the advice will be just get in science, on, in science only if you really like it. And your life in the lab should be, let's say, 50-50 in terms of working 
on the bench and the other 50% reading a lot. Because getting the information is very important and that's very helpful. Otherwise, it will not be so easy, novelty, to, to do novel things. So nice. I think it's important. How about you, Linda? So <clears throat> I think probably um, important things are be passionate about what you do. I think that's what keeps you in science and keeps you working in the area. Um, other things you probably need to realize funding is cyclic. And there'll be downsides and upsides, and I've seen them both. So when there are downsides, you need to be flexible. You need to think of other sources of funding to support your research and keep going. All right, I have one question for you all, and that is, if Margo, if you hadn't been a scientist, what would you have been? Well, when I was a, a young woman, I, I thought about being a, a ballet dancer, and then next was an archaeologist, and, and then I was thinking about going to medical school, but it, really what changed that my mind was my senior year in college, I washed dishes for um, a graduate student, and I sort of listened to her. There was no one else. She had a small cubicle that she worked in, and so it was just the two of us, and she'd tell me about you know, what she was hoping to find. And then when she, if it worked, it was really exciting. And, and that, I, I never even applied to medical school. That's a great story. We always tell people, they ask for advice, how do I get into science? We tell them, go wash dishes in a lab. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're validating that. Luis, uh, how about you? What well, you I think? remember that I wanted to be a teacher. teacher. So that was all my passion at that time. But then I also needed work, money, and to work. And then I got this job in the medicine faculty, which mm -hmm. I enjoy very much. But if I would not be a, a researcher, I would like to be teaching, teaching different levels, because to teach properly, you need to understand what you are talking about. I think and it's the only way to you can teach properly. I think scientists are really teachers in a way anyway. I, that's how I view myself. Linda, how about you? <laughs> well, actually, after the launch of Sputnik um, during my childhood when I was growing up, I really would have liked to have been an astronaut, but I got deadly car sick. <laughs> <laughs> this is maybe not a good, good career to aim for. That's funny you should say that, because the last quiv I did in uh, New Orleans at ASM Microbe was with an astronaut. Uh, she, uh, Kate Rubens was a virologist, uh, and she was working at the Whitehead, and she applied for the astronaut program and got in. And now she went up last year, and so check out the last twiv 444. Um, Stephanie, you can show her how to listen to it, okay? She should listen to that because she is awesome. Oh, great. And you should hear about pipetting in space, how cool it is. You'd think the liquid would fly all over, but it doesn't. It, the surface tension keeps it on the plastic. So she wants to, she's done sequencing, she wants to do cell culture, and you know why she does this? Because they want to put a base on Mars and they need a lab there in order to diagnose things when people get sick. They want to look at the microbiome in space. So listen, TWIV444, uh, Kate Rubens, she's just awesome. All right, we have four minutes left. I know you have another session, so I'll wrap this up. Uh, you can find all the episodes of TWIV at Apple Podcasts. You know, if you have a cell phone, there are apps that you can use to subscribe for free. Every episode you can get, uh, or you can go to microbe.tv slash TWIV. And if, if you have questions or comments, you can send them to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us financially. Uh, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a Patreon account, a PayPal account, Amazon affiliates. We sell T-shirts, mugs, everything at cafepress.com slash twiv. Uh, I want to thank everyone for participating today from Georgia State University. Margo Brinton, thank you so much. Thank you. From the Spanish National Center for Biotechnology, Luis Enjuanez. Thank you so much, Luis. Thank you. From Iowa State University, Linda Safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. And 
I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the organizers of this meeting. Ying Fang, thank you for having me. Susan Baker, thank you for having me. Thanks to the audience. I'm sorry about the sound problems, but they fixed it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the sound people. And I have three more t-shirts to give out here. Anybody want one? One, two, Oh. Hey, Louise, can you grab that shirt and uh, give it to me? One more. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, Ralph, are you going to wear that shirt? Uh, no, it's either medium or large, so you could swap with someone else if you want to. The uh, introductory music on TWIV is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>